Good morning, I am Ann Bowser. I am presenting on using gamification to inspire new citizen science volunteers. This work is being done by researchers on the BioTracker research team, which is a collaboration between the University of Maryland and Brigham Young University. So I'm going to start by explaining what citizen science is, which might be an unfamiliar domain, and explaining how different problems in citizen science can be solved with gamification. Then I'm going to briefly introduce Flora Caching, which is our gamified app that serves as a solution to these problems. And Flora Caching can also be used to answer the research question, how can gamification be used to inspire new citizen science volunteers? So citizen science is essentially public participation in the research process. Different projects ask volunteers to do different tasks. Some projects, like eBird and the Audubon Christmas Bird Count, ask volunteers to collect observational data. Other projects, such as Galaxy Zoo, ask volunteers to analyze large data sets that already exist. These are your typical citizen scientists. <laughs> they're middle-aged or older, they're college educated, and they're motivated by things like the desire to support their communities or contribute to scientific research. They usually participate in projects that support their existing hobbies. Therefore, someone who's interested in birds might join a project that studies migration patterns, or someone who's interested in fishing might join a project that monitors the health of streams. Regardless of the type of data that projects collect, or the ways that they involve their volunteers, the majority of projects face two problems. First, projects struggle to recruit and retain willing volunteers. Second, projects suffer from a lack of resources. To explain the first problem further, I'm going to introduce Project Budburst. Project Budburst is a citizen science project that gathers plant phenology data to study climate change. So what is plant phenology data? Simply, it's the timing of life cycle events. For example, people who are interested in phenology study how a single plant changes throughout the seasons. Important questions in phenology include when does the first leaf bud appear on a tree and when do a tree's leaves begin to turn colors and fall. So because phenology is interested in changes over time, the object studied, in this case a single plant, needs to remain constant. In the best possible scenario, the same person will observe the same plant multiple times. Well, plants go through life cycles and so do people. They move, they lose interest in existing hobbies, and for whatever reason, they stop making natural observations. This illustrates the first problem, recruiting and retaining volunteers. The second problem is simpler. Projects lack resources, both in terms of money and personnel to support their goals. This affects citizen science projects across the board, even the really famous ones that you might have heard about in our keynote speech. For example, Foldit was actually programmed by a group of postdocs, and the first Galaxy Zoo was released before they received a single grant. So, how do you motivate people to do things without a lot of resources? Gamification. <laughs> because we all use slightly different, different definitions, here's the one that I prefer. The use of elements of game design in non-game contexts. This highlights the importance of the elements of games, as opposed to complete games. It also focuses on contexts, which in this case is citizen science. To elaborate further, here are a few examples. In the lower right-hand corner are your heavyweights, or the complete games. Foldit helps scientists understand um, how AIDS reproduces. Eterna is partnering with PBS to get into 10,000 American schools, and iWire was developed by researchers at Harvard with a huge grant to understand the inner workings of the human brain. In contrast, there are three gamified apps that I know of. Happy Moz in the upper left-hand corner is a game-like classification tool where people drag different types of moths into buckets in order to classify them. Old Weather rewards people for transcribing ship logs from the Arctic. And Flora Caching is my project, which I will describe in a bit. So let's return to our traditional citizen science volunteers. They participate like this. They find a project that they care about. They contribute to it over time until, for whatever reason, they stop. There isn't any research to suggest that gamification might make these people want to participate more. In fact, some research exists that suggests they might actually be demotivated by game-like interfaces, particularly bright colors, cartoons, and sound. So instead, we're interested in engaging these people, millennials. They don't fit the model of a traditional citizen scientist. 
but they do appreciate technology in games. They use technology more frequently. For example, 94% of these people own smartphones, I'm sorry, mobile phones, compared to 86% of the total population. They also use technology differently. They are no more likely to do things like use email, but they are twice as likely as their older peers to play video games. Finally, they have more positive attitudes towards technology and how it can be used to um, make society a better place. And for these reasons, we think that they might be more open to contributing to citizen science if it were done via a gamified mobile app. With that said, we don't expect them to participate like traditional citizen scientists do. Instead, we designed a gamified citizen science app to encourage many millennials to make short contributions that as a whole will contribute the same type of data that would be submitted by longer term committed traditional volunteers. With that goal in mind, our research question is this. What would encourage millennials to engage with the gamified citizen science app? Important point of clarification. We're not asking does gamification work, which would require an experimental design. Rather, we're asking how might it work for this group of millennials. And to answer this question, we're conducting research with Flora Caching, a gamified mobile application that feeds phenology data to the Project Budburst database. So Flora Caching supports two major types of interaction. First, people create caches of different plants that are deemed scientifically valuable. This requires expertise, so it needs to either be done by a traditional citizen scientist who knows about plants or a game designer who's implementing the application. The second main task is checking into caches that already exist. This doesn't require any special expertise. Rather, people find caches on a Google map, visit them, and check in by answering questions such as, is the plant blooming, or submitting photos of a plant. And the app is gamified in two ways. It's primarily gamified through different badges which correspond to activities. In this way, scientists can create different activities and things that they're interested in, which we implement through badges. So if someone's interested in cherry trees in April and May, we can create a badge and an activity called Cherry Blossom Blitz, which encourages people to visit these plants during this time. Therefore, we can use badges to continue generating new game content, while also ensuring that the data generated is of scientific value. And the app is also gamified through the use of a leaderboard. And therefore, people are rewarded for both specific types of participation and for their general overall contributions to the application and the data set. So we evaluated a pre-beta version of Flora Caching with 71 college students representing our target group of millennials. These people were aged 18 to 24. They are part of an advanced science and technology studies program at the University of Maryland. And they were in week five of a unit on citizen science, which is potentially problematic, and I will return to it later. We let them evaluate the app by giving them a single task to perform to familiarize them with the interface and make sure that everything was working. After that, we turned them loose for 45 minutes of free play with the application. After the free play, we gave them a Qualtrics survey with closed and open-ended questions. The closed-ended questions ask things like, how likely are you to use flora caching in the future? And how motivated are you by each of these reasons for using the flora caching app? And these produced ordinal data, so we analyzed them using Man Whitney U tests. We also asked open-ended questions, such as, what would motivate you to use flora caching or participate in a similar activity? And to analyze this, we use thematic analysis. So our results were complex, but ultimately encouraging. The first question asked, how likely are you to use the Flora Caching app in the future? And as you can see, answers to this weren't great. Only 14% were very likely or somewhat likely to use the application. And there are a few reasons for this. First of all, this was the first time that we tested the app with more than five users, and people who were using the app on an Android had problems recognizing location. Second, we use some scientific terms like Quarkus alba for white oak that alienated our user group of millennials. And third, we never really expected to engage 100% of people. So while 14% isn't great, it's better than the normal participation of millennials in citizen science, which, although there's no really good data on this, is estimated to be closer to 5%. 
So to address question number two, how motivating are each of these reasons for using the Flora Caching app? We use Man Whitney U tests to compare responses for the people who would use flora caching in the future with responses from those who would not. We elaborate on the responses that were significant with analysis from the third question what would motivate you to use flora caching or participate in a similar activity? So, the first thing that came up was fun, and people define fun in three ways. People really like using the app to be creative. Paparazzi, which is an activity that says pick the coolest um, magnolia tree and photograph it, allows for creativity in photography. I'm not an expert photographer by any means, but I'd like to achieve having the best picture of a tree. People also enjoyed exploring their local environment and relaxation, and these two things are combined into one here. To me, appreciating nature is a way to de-stress, and taking the time to look and appreciate native Maryland trees is appealing. I'm a Marylander and lived in a rural area where trees were abundant and gave a sense of peace and home. People were also significantly motivated by gamification, both individually by earning badges and competing with their peers and more generally. So people thought the badges were a nice touch that should be expanded for future users. One said, introducing competition to citizen science applications can have a lasting impact on the overall effectiveness of the application. These are the types of things that pique the interest of the user. And one person said that more than anything else, if this were more like a game, they would be motivated to use it more. People are also motivated by learning education, both in general and learning about specific plants, such as magnolias. However, this may be secondary. I have some interest, but not enough motivation to go out with a field guide and start teaching myself about plants. Community involvement was a motivator. And lots of people in our millennial user group define community as their group of friends. So we heard a lot of comments like, if the app became popular with my peers, I'd definitely use it to fit in with the crowd. Socialization was another motivator. And this is sort of um, smaller scale community involvement, especially one-on-one -on -one activity. I would like to be able to use this app socially. So on certain occasions, I could not only engage with nature for a benefit, but I could also interact with others for social interaction. A couple of people mentioned, actually, that this would be a good date idea. <laughs> then there are a few things that weren't motivating. We weren't surprised that millennials weren't particularly interested in plants. And we heard things like, maple trees are everywhere. That's like getting excited every time you see a dandelion. You can't hype up generic, boring trees. We were also not surprised that this user group wasn't particularly motivated to contribute to science or to contribute to the public good. With that said, we were surprised that these people weren't motivated to do their best, or they weren't motivated by complete, completing different activities, although we think this is probably because they were just more motivated by other game mechanics, such as competition or using badges. So here's the takeaway. Is there support for designing gamified citizen science applications? We think the answer is a qualified yes. So only 14% were likely or very likely to use the app. But as I mentioned earlier, this is a big jump over the traditional number of millennials who would contribute to projects like this. And more importantly, those who would use the app would do so precisely because it is gamified. And this quotation sums it up nicely. Something that would motivate me to use a similar app in the future would be the gamification characteristics that this one employed. It makes it much more fun and less tedious to participate in citizen science. So a few limitations, location awareness and using scientific names for plants have both been resolved. Generalizability, this only applies to millennials, not to older user groups or traditional citizen science volunteers. Um, for future work, the really obvious opportunity is an experimental manipulation that compares a gamified citizen science app with a natural user interface. We also see this as an opportunity to teach people different roles. So maybe millennials could slowly become more interested in plants and learn about plant identification and then be able to do things like create caches instead of just checking into them. And finally, we're looking at different ways to use the app to support player interaction, especially interaction between user groups. And the most exciting part of our future work is that the beta will be launched on October 26th. So thank you very much. Thank you.